Uta here with another diversity bouquet. This time we've got some red clover, peony, rose, wonderful bright yellow coreopsis, this wildflower called beard tongue, the calendula. Uh, we have a few other things in there, one lark ascending rose, my favorite. It will bloom the rest of the summer, but not quite as floriferously uh, as it did to start off with. This is a little exciting thing that I have, a uh, seed pod of the echolegia, the columbine, and it will um, later mature and have these rattling little tiny uh, poppy seed uh, size seeds, black like poppy seeds, and um, but I hear uh, a little bit toxic, so don't put them into your uh, cake or anything. Um, but I toss them around in the woods and I'm trying to grow more of them. I'm just testing out this shirt, which I ironed today for a test run before I do my interview with Tammy Peterson, the wife of Dr. Jordan Peterson. She has her own YouTube channel under Tammy Peterson. And she has interviewed very interesting people, such as the South African author Mark Mathabane. And I'm going to have to tell her I met him <laughs> when I was working at a bookstore on the Upper West Side. He was a student at Columbia University. So I remember him. It was, uh, anyway, check out her channel. Um, so, yes, what are we talking about today? So it is the six trans misunderstandings of cross-dressing. And uh, I am really thinking about how I sort of have the capacity to um, analyze what are the behavioral rewards um, of the uh, act of putting on makeup and pretending to be a female for a person who is male. Um, I have much more familiarity because of my ex-husband, Nettie, who started cross-dressing unbeknownst to me, probably when I was pregnant with our second child. And he was lying to me about where he went, and um, I'm sure that added to his excitement. He was going, according to his diaries, to gay bars on 8th Avenue in Manhattan, and uh, why you are going to write in your diary about attracting heterosexual men when you're sitting in a gay bar uh, in one of the uh, gay capitals of the world, New York City. Uh, I, I uh, don't quite understand, and I uh, do contest the whole concept that this behavior constitutes a true life test. And the reason I am uh, going through these six uh, aspects of the male cross-dressing um, to break it down into what is probably just sensory calming and not uh, the new persona being the one that this guy needs to be, um, and so there are physical aspects of this which just coincidentally might be calming um, to the vagus nerve, particularly the vagus nerve being the largest nerve, I think it's called number 10, uh, from the brain down into the torso. And it is often the uh, source when our body, uh, we feel it in this vagus nerve somewhere here or with chest pain or with, uh, you know, stomach aches and stuff like that when we are stressed out. And um, it has to do with the cortisol and the adrenaline and all these things overstressing our body. And so I remember with my uh, video that I did when uh, Exolancic visited here, um, we did a short thing on um, the behavioral results of cross-dressing that don't really have anything to do with the cross-dressing. And um, I've thought about this even more, and I, I pose that because I uh, 
was a trained professional dancer and a keen observer of movement, um, I pose that uh, there are coincidental calming qualities for somebody like Nettie when he puts on the femininity outfits. So um, the first thing is the excitement. It's really like being in a play. It's like dressing up and putting on makeup and playing a part. Suddenly you are Ophelia. Suddenly you are Lady Macbeth, etc. Or it's like Halloween or Purim. It's some kind of a dress up uh, situation and uh, that's just exciting. You get little dopamine hits and a little bit of endorphins and things going on having to do with making this whole plan, planning out the time. It's, it's also sort of a very self-involved thing where you're blocking out the time to spend it by yourself and uh, oddly, <laughs> when Nettie was doing this and glancing side to side, wondering if any straight men might be, you know, making eye contact with him in the gay bars in Greenwich Village, <laughs> um, I think he was thinking that it was like being in the French Resistance, you know, like those old movies, like you're in a Bogart movie all of a sudden or something like that. And you are getting narcissistic fuel from uh, the people who are helping you to do this. You're getting narcissistic fuel from that bartender who is making sure uh, to let you know where the ladies room is or to signal in some way to you that that person is going to affirm this uh, show that you are putting on. So there's the excitement. You're planning, you're putting on makeup, you're, uh, if you had in school, which all of us had some kind of uh, experiences putting on a show. Um, I had my kindergarten students and my pre-K students uh, putting on shows. And, and so they, you know, you put on the costume. I know this from being a dancer. There were times when <clears throat> I was really pretty tired and it had been a long week or maybe it was two weekends in a row with three performances, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night or something like that. And then I put on the costume and my stage makeup and I was the part. And so that's number one. It's uh, excitement that probably doesn't have that much to do with this new person that he thinks he is. Then uh, there's the planning for it, which is the shopping and the whole uh, obsession with shopping and getting clothes that are going to help you pass or that are going to be feminine. This happens to be silk, you know, and something that has little details, special buttons, a ruffle, something um, that uh, is going to please you and you imagine how you're going to go through this and uh, go out and just be this new so-called woman in uh, some special place where you're playing the game of uh, pretend French resistance Humphrey Bogart movie. So, and oh yes, the other thing about the shopping addiction is um, that it's not only the narcissistic thing of spending a lot of money on yourself, but um, it is an approved by the therapist shopping addiction. The therapists are not saying, oh well, how much are you gonna spend? Can you really afford this? Can you really afford uh, Lord and Taylor, can you really afford those fake alligator skin shoes? Oh, and the purses, right? The purses is a whole other piece of this. Uh, so this uh, narcissistic fuel of the shopping and getting the affirmation of people 
who are working for you. <laughs> the salespeople are going along on this play acting. Um, so that's number two. Uh, number three is you are pretending an inauthentic but shiny new persona and you're leaving your old downtrodden uh, work obsessed self uh, on the hook at home and going out and uh, thinking about the way you use words, you're uh, thinking about the way you use gestures. I knew that Nettie copied my gestures. I, I got such a creepy feeling about the fact that we knew each other for 18 years or something by the time I figured this out and that he had been memorizing my gestures for all that time. It, it made the relationship seem so inauthentic and contrived. So uh, that's number three. Then, I, this is really what uh, got me going on this. Um, as I mentioned in one of my recent videos, there's this um, kind of looking side to side thing and slight shimmying of the torso. So the, the eye movements with going side, uh, going uh, to the left in your peripheral vision and then to the right in your peripheral vision, I'm sure that Nettie would say, oh, I was doing that, you know, just without bringing notice to myself, you know, to make sure that nobody's going to uh, bully me or do something to me. But on the other hand, actually, um, he was looking and hoping that someone was noticing him. I know that because he wrote it in his diaries. And the fact is, in my research on calming exercises for the vagus nerve, doing this peripheral vision exercise and holding your eyes in that peripheral uh, place for, they recommend, for as much as say um, uh, 30 seconds. Uh, and and one, uh, in one I was watching it said, um, keep on doing this until you start yawning and yawning is a sign of relaxation. So coincidentally, this particular watchful movement of the eyes side to side could make that cross-dressing man feel calmer because it just happens to be an exercise that calms your vagus nerve. My theory is that there's an evolutionary aspect to this and that it's knowing that there isn't some uh, predatory animal <laughs> that's, uh, you know, in your area. <laughs> And so you're keeping yourself uh, protected uh, and, and you're engaging in uh, human watchfulness. So um, I think that just coincidentally, those particular gestures could make the person feel calmer. So then they go into the shrink and say, yeah, I felt so much better when I was doing that. I'm sure this is what I need to do. And the shrink should be knowing and explaining to that patient Oh, that is actually possibly related to uh, this EDMI type eye movement. Uh, I can't remember what that acronym uh, stands for, but it's EDMI is this, this eye movement exercises, which there are specialists in this for people who have PTSD. It's supposed to help you to calm down and to get, uh, to get the cortisol slowed down and to get the dopamine up and stuff like that to, to help uh, deal with the PTSD. So the, the uh, practitioners are not explaining the functions of the nervous system to this person. And so this business of the uh, checking out left and right constantly in the uh, person who's cross-dressing they could be actually just unintentionally doing a vagus nerve calming exercise. And it doesn't really have to do with their true self. So that was number four. 
Then um, to go back to the movements that I uh, described, I in that one recent video I talked about the guy in the black pants and the t-shirt who was so obviously doing this. I was watching him from across the street. And the thing is, there's, uh, there's a little bit of calming to just sort of loosen you know, what you're doing with your torso. The guy thought that he was demonstrating how loose and feminine he is because women are naturally more flexible in their joints. Um, however, doing small movements is also coincidentally calming because you might be holding a lot of tension in, you know, this torso area of your body. Plus it also reverberates down to your hips. And then there's a certain amount of either, a low amount of sexual arousal, um, with it reverberating into the, the hip girdle or for the autogynophiles who are going around jerking off in the women's locker room or the change room or uh, the ladies' bathroom, they are uh, uh, going down this path of <laughs> sort of uh, masturbation, basically, foreplay with themselves. And then if they come to climax, then there's all the endorphins and pleasure um, hormones that come with that. So then of course, that's gonna seem like this pleasurable experience, but it doesn't have to come from the cross-dressing. That is just coincidental. And uh, number six also has to do with the torso. And this is interesting to me because um, this has to do with the men who are putting on some falsies and um, putting on a brassiere and all this women's undergarments to uh, do sex signaling by uh, a sign that, you know, they're a female because they have breasts. And I was thinking about a, a vest. We would have a weighted vest that was, it had to be prescribed by the occupational therapist or the physical therapist for a child who has ADHD, that type of fidgetiness. And, and having this sort of like weight on them, it would be, it would have little pieces of weights on the vest so that it was pressing, kind of like similar to swaddling a baby. And so is this also a coincidental function of uh, calming of the uh, sensation of something pressing on your torso? And this guy, like Nettie, is uh, making it into something more by uh, the breast uh, imitation. So those are the six things. Thank you to all the new subscribers. We went up suddenly uh, about 20 in a day. Thank you to whoever it is that's reposting these on Twitter. Um, I think I have a new trans widow in the pipeline. Uh, it, just, it just doesn't stop. I'm gonna have to start making a chart. Um, so uh, some of the questions are, uh, do you notice any of these six? things uh, that seem to be going on with your husband's cross-dressing. And also, uh, we have to try to keep some data about what percentage of us got choked or uh, what, um, how many of these men were uh, in some way violent because I'm finding it's about um, 25%, 20 to 25%. Of course, our sample at this point is a small sample. But on the other hand, in one of the Dutch studies, which is used as a protocol, the um, final questionnaire was only filled out by 33 people who did that so-called transition. Go to my uh, WordPress blog, utahagengrasswidow.wordpress.com for the Dr. Julia Mason analysis of that very poorly done Dutch study of De Vries and Martinius and Stizma 
from 2004 and which is used, unfortunately, as the basis for most of what is called in the U.S. affirmative care. All right, if it's cool enough, I'm going to be heading back out to the garden.